We've all just completed another round of God's annual holy days, and uh, we've all returned from what appears to have been a joy-filled Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, that, of course, looks forward to the receiving of our inheritance. And then we had the last great day, which spoke of the glorious future that is ahead for all of humanity. But then after that, we all got our suitcases packed. Some of us got in a plane, some of us got in a car, and we all came back home. <laughs> and here we are. We're back at home. We are still looking forward to the fulfillment of those prophetic holy days. But for now, we're back to our wandering in the wilderness. That is the title for the message today, Into the Wilderness. The wilderness, the wilderness in Scripture is a place where God's people are subject to, to testing, to facing trials, to resisting temptation, and persevering until we receive our promise, which for us is the receipt of everlasting life and a place in God's family. And when God led Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he took them to a wilderness. He took them to the wilderness of Sinai, which is that triangular piece on the map that's there between Egypt and Israel. That's the Sinai wilderness, desert, desolate place. He took them there for instruction and to prepare them for entering into their inheritance which for them was the promised land, the land of Canaan. But almost all out of those millions of people that God led out of Egypt died in that same wilderness. They died in the wilderness. And only their children were allowed to enter into the inheritance, which was the promised land. Their experience is a warning and it is an instruction for us as we face yet another year of wandering in the wilderness. The wilderness of this world. So today our purpose, my purpose, our purpose, is to review the wilderness trials of Israel and see what warnings, what lessons are there for us so that we can move forward in this year that has begun and is now upon us in a way that's successful and moves us forward in God's great purpose for us and for his church. I have four points. The first point, point number one, when in the wilderness, when wandering in the wilderness, commit yourself to following God's lead. Commit yourself to following God's lead. Go to Numbers 9. Numbers 9, verse 15, we'll read through verse 23. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law, was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. And God was with Israel in this cloud. And that is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it. And at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whether the cloud lifted, or sorry, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command they encamped, and at the Lord's command they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through 
Moses. So I think it's pretty clear. God led Israel from place to place. He gave them shade from the burning desert sun through the cloud during the daytime. And at night, when it's very cold in the desert, they got heat from the fire. They had to go. They had to go when and where God led. And he did this to test them. Now, your creator, mine, all of ours, has led some in this congregation into difficult and dark places in the past year. Some people, it's been great. So there's people that are flying high, doing well, and there are people that are not. It's important for all of us, no matter which category we fit into, to remember that in both, whether we are flying high or whether we are traveling low, he's doing this to test you. And to prove you. I like, I like prove you better. We don't say it like that in, in the English vernacular of our day very much. But to prove you, God wants to know what you're made of. Now Israel's time in the wilderness actually should have been fairly short. It would have been about two years long. Which was plenty of time for God to accomplish what he seemed to have wanting to get accomplished. He was giving them all kinds of instruction and information about how they were going to move forward into the, into the promised land. And uh, so he did that. You see that a lot of what we see in the first five books of Moses really happened in the very front end of this whole process in the first two years. Exodus gave them a great outline of the broad principles of justice, community life, worship. Then Leviticus, which filled in a lot of details about sacrifice, cleanness, holy days, the priesthood, then numbers. The first half of numbers was really kind of going through the chronological sequence of their travels and their journeys right up to the edge of the promised land, which I don't know if you've ever looked at the journeys of Israel. If you have a map book, you might see that. But right off the bat, they went right up to the edge of the promised land. And there they were. There they were. And then something went wrong. Go to Numbers 13. Let's take a look at verse 17 through 20. This is probably part of the Bible that you've gone through with your, your kids or maybe your parents went through it with you about the sending of the spies into the land of Canaan. And these guys had been selected, one from each tribe, and they were to check out this new land. In verse 17, it says, When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and into the hill country and see what the land is like, and whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season of the first ripe grapes. So the spies went out and they did just that. They went out into the land and they explored around. They came back and they talked to the people about what they had seen and what they had found. And, and they said, yeah, indeed, it is, a, it is a pretty awesome place. It's just as wonderful as promised. But, but it's going to be really hard. Because these people are scary, and they're big, and they're tough, and they're mean, and oh, and they, they basically gave this report to the people of Israel, saying, yeah, it's great, but it's going to be too hard. So go to chapter 14 of Numbers, and let's take a look at verses 1 through 11. And the people were kind of freaked out by this, this bad report. And then in verse 1 through 11, it says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled and complained. And you'll see that as a theme throughout this entire message here. Grumbling and complaining against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. 
Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land. So there's two of the spies there. They tore their clothes and they said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we'll devour them. They're ours. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. If you think about what these people had experienced, they had been drawn out of Egypt. They had seen some pretty amazing stuff. Miraculous, you know, stuff that would blow my mind if I saw it culminating with the parting of the Red Sea, that they could pass through it. But now, here they are on the edge of the promised land, and they, they don't want to go <laughs> because they're scared. They don't want to go. And I think the lesson there, I don't, I mean, it's pretty easy to connect the dots, how that applies to us, right? Don't be fearful in this coming year. Don't be fearful. Follow God's lead. Sometimes, you know, we're led into challenging places, trials, tests, follow his lead. Sometimes we're, some of you are going to experience tremendous blessings in the coming year. That too comes with temptation and testing. Just follow God's lead no matter what your circumstances are in the coming year. Drop down to verse 27 of Numbers 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble and complain against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall, and every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has, was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness, and your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years. Whoa. So two years just turned into 40. And they got what they wished for. And if only we die in the wilderness instead of going into Canaan. And this is, that's a lesson that I uh, mentioned to my family. My kids have heard this many times. Be careful what you wish for because you might get it. It's just one of those things that, uh, it's, a, it's not the main lesson of the message, of course, but it's one of those little things that I've always tried to remember myself and pass on to my kids. Be careful what you wish for. You might get it. In many ways, the, the wandering of Israel in the wilderness are like the years of our, our mortal physical lives. Right? There's an analogy there. There's a parallel there. If you think about it, we too have been redeemed. You know, we have been drawn out of our bondage to sin. And we're wandering in the wilderness, and the old man, the old person that we were, must die. Dies in the wilderness. Right? It's only the new person, the new creation that goes on to the promise, which for us is not a land, territory. It's the promise of eternal life. However, with a lesson like that, an essential ingredient to, to learning and fully making the most out of this lesson from Israel's wanderings, will be lost on a lot of people in, in our society. It'll be lost on anyone who does not understand or who ignores or who teaches against obedience to God's commands. And I am just astounded and amazed. I sometimes let myself think otherwise, but people are teaching, actively teaching against God's commands. Every day 
in every way against God's commands. How can, how can they truly understand what God was trying to accomplish with Israel if that is the perspective? Go to Deuteronomy 8. Sometimes stuff happens, you know, this happens in our, in our own lives, where we don't really figure out why that happened until later. And it's only after having time to kind of digest it and think about it that we get why that happened. And God does that in Scripture as well. And here in Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 10, he talks to them about the wandering in the wilderness. And he has something very important to say about why. In verse 1, let's start there, it says, Be careful. So let me, let me make the setting here. The Israelites are back after 40 years. They've been wandering in the desert, and now they are back where they were, when, they, when the spies went out, they're back in the same spot, ready to go into the promised land. And God wants to tell them a couple of things. He says to them, be careful. And that, I think, is one of the purposes of today's message, to be careful in the coming year. To be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the, Gord, the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you and he caused you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell during the 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord. Walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, deep springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. It's God's desire that you learn to obey his commands. That's one of his central purposes, one of the central purposes for you know, your life, for your trials, for your tests. God wants to know if you will obey his commands. And so he leads you into situations to see if you will obey. As I mentioned, there are some in this congregation and every congregation around the country who are flying high in the coming year. The stock market's doing well got promoted on my job. And then there are people in every congregation, including this one, who are, things are not going well. There's trials, there's testing, perhaps sickness. And in all these ways, he does this to test and to prove you. To, he wants to know if he can trust you to live his way, a way of love and a way of service before you inherit eternal life. It's what he wants to know. And his commands are the beginning. There's more that we must build on top of the commands. We know that. We talk about it. But his commands are the beginning. They are the foundation of how we understand uh, and practice love towards God. And it's the foundation and the beginning of understanding on how we show love towards one another. It's the foundation. We want to build on that. There's much we need to build on that, but it is the foundation so God is wanting to know, will you keep my commands? Yes or no? God is testing your dependability. And so we have trials. We wander in the wilderness. Stuff happens. Trials, and they measure and they test our conversion. And then sometimes they correct us to keep us on the right path. And sometimes we have suffering so that we might be perfected, just as Jesus Christ himself was perfected through suffering. We have trials and tests that strengthen our resolve to obey our Creator. All right, so now we know what's 
ahead, okay? <laughs> now we know what's ahead, we know what's expected of us, we know what we're going to go through. Let's use this same passage that we just read to learn a bit more about how we accomplish it. Point number two, nourish yourself with the bread from heaven. When you're wandering through the wilderness, nourish yourself with the bread from heaven. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, we read that Israel were fed with manna, which literally means, what is it? Now, God could have fed them other ways. He could have fed them with quail. Uh, there's a, a section in Scripture where you know, he, he did that. He fed them with quail, I think it was you know, for a week or so, uh, just to basically show them that he could. He could have fed them with quail every day for 40 years. And he could have spiced it up with some vegetables, some onions, leeks, a little bit of curry powder. Could have fallen from the sky, right? But he didn't. Instead, he gave them something that was unique, different from anything they'd seen or experienced before, such that they all looked at it and said, what? <laughs> what is this? It was also, if you think about it, something that couldn't be gotten anywhere else except from God. He gave it to them. And in the same way, we have God's word. You have in your lap. I have up here. We all have it. God's word, which is spiritual nourishment that you receive from God. What you get in this word, you're not going to be able to get anywhere else. It is unique. It is different. And it's from God. And it will nourish you spiritually. Go to Exodus 16, verse 14. This is actually close in time to the whole quail episode. We're just going to read verses 14 and 16, which say, When the dew was gone, so in the morning, when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. So right there we actually see uh, something interesting. The gathering of the manna involved obedience to some instructions. Not the commandments per se, but some instructions. All right? They were told to gather a certain amount. And if you read on, we're not going to go through the whole episode, but they were told when. So they could gather it six days, but they were not to gather it on the seventh day. And that's a it'll, very interesting message, um, but it would take a lot of time to go through it all. So they had to follow God's lead, even in this manna, you know, getting the manna. Now, Scripture tells us that manna was symbolic of spiritual nourishment. Go to John 6, verse 48. And we'll read uh, through 51. Yeah. Jesus' words, he says, I, that's him speaking of himself, am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they, they died. They still died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And this bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of this world. So, on one level, we eat of this bread each year at the Passover, and we do it as a remembrance of uh, Jesus' sacrifice of his body and his blood so that we might be redeemed, so that we even have a hope of anything good ever coming of our life because our sins are paid for. So that kind of kicks the whole thing off and makes anything else possible. So we eat of the spiritual bread in that way. But there's more. There's more to it. Drop down to verse 60. It says here, on hearing this, many of the disciples said, Whoa, that's a hard teaching. Who can accept this? And aware that his disciples were grumbling. Notice again, it refers to grumbling. <laughs> Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit 
gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Before Jesus became flesh, when he came in the flesh, he was with God, he was God, and he was known by a name, if you will, the Word. Go to John 1, 1 and read that section and you'll see what I mean. So he's the Word. He's the Logos, if you want it in Greek. He's the Word. And we eat of this bread when we take in his words and his teachings through reading, through the study of the scriptures, but also through instruction, which is what we are gathered here today for, and for uh, explanation from the ministry and from the teachers that the resurrected living Christ has placed within his church. So, in this coming year, in order to nourish yourself with the bread from heaven, I urge you to pay attention, listen, nourish yourself. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 also says that we should not live by bread alone. What does that mean? Sounds like I just contradicted, right? Well, in that saying that we should not live by bread alone, we're talking about the physical bread there. You know, when Jesus said there, hey, the, the Israelites ate that bread and they still died. So the scripture there in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 told us we should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What does living by bread alone mean? Well, I put it to you that living by bread alone means spending all your time and all your effort and all your energy and your mental focus on seeing to your physical needs. And don't get me wrong, God wrong, Bible wrong, whatever. God knows that you need this stuff. He knows very well what you need. Food, clothing, shelter. Even he knows you need relaxation. You need some time off. He knows you need pleasure. He knows your needs. And he expects you to work diligently, work hard to provide them for yourself and for others. And when you do that, he says, I'll bless you. It's kind of a yin-yang sort of thing. He wants you to work hard. But he says, and I'll bless you. No problem. That's kind of how it works. However, your creator does not want your natural, innate focus on taking care of your physical needs to crowd out the spiritual development that he is also working out in you. Go to Matthew 6, verse 33. Memory scripture, good one to always bear in mind and kind of use it as a, I don't know, you could use it as a prod, you could use it as an encouragement. If you look at the chapter, Jesus has just gone through teaching on this very subject about physical needs, saying, look, God knows you need these things. This is where we get the famous sayings about the little sparrows, you know, the, the, the clothing of the flowers and all this wonderful stuff. And he says, God knows you need all this stuff. And then in verse 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then he tells him, don't worry. He says, don't worry about it. God will take care of you. What is living by every word of God? We said, no man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Well, what does living by every word of God mean? Let's go back to Deuteronomy 8 for that. And we'll just read it right there in the verse. It's pretty plain, pretty straightforward. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell for 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. That's what living by every word of God means. In some ways, you could say all Israel had to do was just to obey him and he would take care of them. Point number three, ask. <laughs> when in the wilderness, ask for what you need. If you need something, ask for it. I don't know if you've experienced this with your kids. I have. There are many times when Laura and I have looked at each other and just said, why didn't they just ask? Instead of, they, they'll come up with some convoluted workaround situation to get what they need. They could have just asked. 
In the same way, if you need something from God, ask. Now, if you think about what was going on in this you know, wilderness experience of Israel, God showered manna down upon them. And it was there every morning, lying on the ground. Okay? But water, water was not showered down upon them. In fact, it was kind of a touchy issue there. They had to ask for water. It was in this way that they really got themselves into some trouble because they, they had a rotten attitude about it. They were impatient. They were annoyed if it didn't just happen. They were rude, and they complained. And they stirred up others to abandon God's plan. Hey, he's not providing water for us. Let's just go back to Egypt. Had enough of this. This is the kind of stuff they were up to, right? This is bad attitude. So, okay, back to the analogy. Manna came down from the sky. Every morning it was there, lying on the ground. All they had to do was kind of just go and like, rake it up. In the same way, if you will, God provides for you a great deal of spiritual instruction. How many people in this room do not have a Bible? Raise your hand if you do not have a Bible. Okay, raise your hand if you don't have two. Raise your hand if you don't have three. Okay, we got one. <laughs> right. But I'm, I'm sure there's more than three in your house. But personally, okay. Yeah, no, seriously, think about it. You've got access to God's truth, God's word. And I would add to that that um, the church, the church of God, the United Church of God, as, as, as an example, produces so much instruction and so much material, you can't even go through it all. So it's there. It's like manna. It's just lying on the ground, okay? But to make the most of it, to understand it, to use it, to apply it, to get it into your life to make sense, you need God's Spirit. Because think about it. All that information is on the Internet. Everybody in the world can get access to it. Millions of people visit the website every year and do nothing with it. To make something of it, you need God's Spirit. And also, considering you know, the context of tests, trials, suffering, to understand tests, to understand trials, to understand suffering, you need God's Spirit. And so, ask for it every day. Ask for it. Let's take a look at a, a few scriptures on that. Luke 11, verse 13. Jesus is teaching about prayer, and at the end of that, he says, If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Philippians 1, verse 19. Paul writing here to his uh, congregation there in Philippi. He says to them, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, Paul was going through some very serious problems right here. He was in prison. He was going to be executed at some point. He was in trouble. And he says to them, it's through God's Spirit, which thank you very much for praying for me. God's Spirit will help me get through this. You need God's Spirit to get through trials, tests, and suffering. Now, go to Acts 5, verse 33. I want you to pay particular attention to this verse. Acts 5, verse 32. One of the apostles, Peter speaking here, says, We are witnesses of these things, events that have happened, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who obey him. There's a lot in that. You can just sit and chew on that for a while, and hopefully will. God's Spirit, he gives it to people who obey him. And if you think about the experience in the wilderness and what he was doing with the people there, testing them, will you, will you obey me? And I don't know, maybe this is too speculative, but it seems to me like God will stop giving you his spirit if you, if you refuse to obey. 
So it works together. You know, you pray for the Spirit, you want the Spirit, but He wants you to respond. Who likes talking to someone who never responds? I mean, if you keep phoning a person, they never answer the phone. You keep texting them, they never text back. What do you do? You drop it, right? you got to respond. God wants you to respond. Point number four. This is kind of a more involved point here, final point. Some specific things to avoid. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 6. Paul writing here to the Corinthians says... Okay, he's, he's kind of plowing through the same material that we are today. He's looking at the wanderings in the wilderness of Israel, and he's saying, this is something we can learn from. In verse 1, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, sisters, she's speaking to the church, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The next four verses... If they'd had bullet points when they were writing, they would have had bullet points here, I think, because the next four verses are like point one, point two, point three, point four, And that's kind of how I'm going to break it down. First, so the sub-point A, false representations of God, false ideas about God. And that would be verse 7. Paul writes to them, don't be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. This is a reference to the golden calf issue, which, again, is another one of those stories which you probably have gone through with your kids or learned in, in, in um, you know, Sabbath school yourself or whatever. It's a reference to the golden calf episode, which is found in Exodus 32. Now, after, let's just set the scene here, after confirming the covenant... Moses had gone off up the mountain and he was receiving further instruction about the tabernacle and priesthood and things like that from, from Yahweh, from God. And the people down at the bottom of the mountain there were getting restless. <laughs> In a, the same way that so many people do, they wanted some kind of physical reassurance that God was with them. And... You know, they were standing there and they, where, where is this Moses guy? I don't, we don't have Moses around. I don't see God. I don't see Moses. We need something. So they strong arm Aaron into making this golden calf for them. Which, you know, if you read that section there in Exodus 32, they meant it to represent Yahweh, the God who had led them out of Egypt. This is the God who led you out of Egypt. And then they declared a festival and they sang and they danced. And God was very displeased with them. Now, there's so many directions you could take that in. Let's take a look at a couple, though, okay? Many people want God to be something that he's not. That's very common. Let me give you a, a theological example, which is bubbled up from time to time. Words and explanations can never really explain God. But it's very common for people to sort of construct an idea in a box made out of words and then want to stuff God in it and say, he has to fit inside this box. And it's full of conjectures and ideas. And uh, as a warning, I say to you, do not indulge yourself in strange speculations about the nature of God. All right? Just don't. Another aspect of this lesson here is, you know, wanting things to be something they're not, is sometimes people find themselves dissatisfied with the worship service. They want it to be more this, they want it to be more that. I mean, some people want it to be more solemn, some people want it to be more fun and festive. You can't win. <laughs> some people, I, mean, I hear, you know, wow, I wish services were more entertaining, uh, more contemporary music. I've heard that dozens of times. More physical expressions of joy and rejoicing more observable evidence of the Spirit. Some people just want better coffee. But there's always something. And there are churches out there that, uh, 
frankly, that seem, they seem to be more concerned about these things than they are about the truth of God. Our first priority here is godly instruction. That is our top priority. That is what we are here for. That is our top priority. Everything else comes after that. We begin with godly instruction. Look, don't get me wrong. Don't get the Bible wrong. Don't get God wrong. Music, expression, stuff like that is good stuff. God loves it. It's biblical. It's there. All that stuff you can, except for the coffee, is there in Scripture. And we all want more of it. And we do what we can. All right? We do what we can. But these things are secondary. And our top priority is godly instruction. Everything else, and we'd love to add it, but we, we, we have to start with that and focus on that and make sure that is always the cornerstone and the, what we provide. If we can do more, we will. Let's take a look at verse 8. It says, We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. This is a reference to the men of Israel and the prostitutes of Moab, which you can read about in Numbers 25. Israel, of course, was back. They were on the edge of the promised land. They were about to go in, and the nations around there saw this big mass of people. They'd heard of the miracles. They were scared. What if that happens to us? Are they going to crush us and destroy us and kick us out of our land? Balak, the king of Moab, he was afraid of Israel. So he, he paid the prophet Balaam to pronounce a curse on Israel. He said, all right, pronounce a curse on these people, and I'll pay you well. So Balaam proceeded to try, and if you read the account, he couldn't. He couldn't curse them. Everything that came out of his mouth was blessings. But he wanted his money, so he gave him some advice, very sound advice, sadly. He recommended, Balaam recommended to this Balak guy that he lure the Israelites into sin by sending in the prostitutes, the religious prostitutes. The plan worked, and God was very displeased. Now this year, I'm not going to go into this in depth because a, I want to follow up on some of this stuff with, with you know, more full-blown messages. But this year, as we wander our way through the wilderness, we live in a society that is up to its eyeballs in sex and uh, drugs, uh, entertainment, which <laughs> seems to be mostly focused on sex and drugs as well, <laughs> sort of circular, Food, drink, all this stuff. All I'm going to say today is, as we wander through the wilderness in this coming year, be on guard and exert self-control. We'll touch more on it later. Let's take a look at verse 9. So here, here's Paul's points, point 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Verse 9, he says, We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. This refers to the people of Israel getting edgy, um, getting angry, impatient, and demanding that God produce miracles on the spot. Exodus 17, verse 1. These are the episodes that relate to water and asking for water. And I mentioned that they got themselves into some serious trouble on this. You know, I mean, you can go to God in prayer, and you can get yourself in some trouble actually you could go to god and you could demand stuff that would be very i don't advise it let's just put it that way um exodus 17 verse 1 the whole israelite community set out from the desert of sin traveling from place to place as the lord commanded they camped at rephidim but there was no water for the people to, to drink so they quarreled with moses that's why i characterized it as edgy they were edgy, impatient, testy. They quarreled with Moses and they said, give us water to drink. They were making demands. They, they, you know, they wanted it there, then, at that moment. Now go to Numbers 21, verses uh, 4 through 5. Another episode that happened more than once. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 5. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. I didn't like the manna, I guess. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think it'd be tough to eat the same thing every day, but they complained, and God was very displeased. Very displeased. I think we all experience this, that we are tempted to think that if God doesn't answer our requests, if he doesn't answer us quickly and, you know, in the way that we're expecting it, that somehow that means he's not with us. And we get annoyed and go, I'm doing everything I should. Why aren't you doing this and that? You know, we, 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 we want the answers when we want, how we want. And this is a test that shows up in, in a mul multiple ways. I mean, one of the, the saddest ways, most challenging ways, is when it shows up in re regard to requests for healing. You know, because people really want to be healed. We want them to be healed. And sometimes it doesn't work out the way we want it to or expect. But it also shows up in some more mundane ways, all right? More day-to-day, -day, if you will. Here are a couple that I, I hear from time to time. Well, I will start to tithe faithfully once God gives me a better job where I can make more money. That is a manner of testing God. God needs to perform. He needs to, you know, pony up and then I will obey. Or how about this? I will start keeping the Sabbath and the holy days properly once God fixes the situation I'm in at work or with my wife or whatever. Again, this is testing God. Right? I'll do what God wants when he performs for me. God does not like that sort of stuff. He, he really doesn't like it. You know, one of the temptations of Satan to Christ was to do the same thing. Throw yourself off the building so God has to save you. Prove, make him prove himself to you. And Jesus said, no, that is not how you do things. All right, number four of our list here would be verse 10. Uh, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 10, which says, And do not grumble as some of them did. And they were killed by the destroying angel. And we've heard the word grumbling a number of times in the scriptures that we've read. It was a constant problem. But this is a reference specifically to the sons of Korah, the sons of Korah who challenged Moses and Aaron and their right to stand as leadership of the people. And you can read about that in Numbers 16, or chapter 16 of Numbers and chapter 17, the rebellion of the sons of Korah. And they basically said, I'm going to try and boil two whole chapters into a sentence here. They basically said, God is just as much with us, any one of us, as he is with you, Moses, you, Aaron. So why should you be in charge? That's basically what they said. God was very displeased. He did not like that. Now, how might that show up in a little old congregation like ours? It shows up in little ways. And, you know, we have to think about what we say and what we talk about and stuff like that. But, you know, you've done it. I've done it. We've all done it. Complain. You know, oh, I... I don't like the way things are being done around here. You know, I, 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 the, the way that they're managing this is just really dumb. If they would just listen to me, you know, then things would get better. Now, maybe you're right. <laughs> That's possible. But, you know, you can complain. I don't like this. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too early. It's too late. I don't know. It's very hard to please all the people all the time, as Abe Lincoln said. So... In the wilderness this coming year, don't be a complainer. <laughs> don't be a complainer. It doesn't look good on me. I know from experience. It doesn't look good on me. It doesn't look good on you either. Don't be a complainer. God doesn't like it. So in conclusion, we've now looked at this. It's interesting that Paul writes, let's read verse 11 here. It says, about these things. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the final age has come. So if you think your standing is firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation, no test, no trial, no suffering 
has come upon you, except which is common to all mankind. Everybody goes through this stuff. We all walk in the wilderness and we all have tests and trials. God is faithful, though, and he will not let you be tempted, tested, tried beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. Hopefully this year will be a good year for you. I hope more and more people are on the upside. They're experiencing great stuff. But, you know, people are going to suffer this year, too. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tests. We don't know who. We don't know where. We don't know what. Let's remember, though, as we walk into this coming year, our walk in the wilderness, that we are strangers and pilgrims. This is not what it's all about for us. We're looking forward to that promised land, the inheritance. Our Creator God has promised to bring us into a good and a pleasant place. We just celebrated uh, you know, the foretaste of some of that at the feast. It is our promised inheritance of life everlasting and a position within the ruling family of God. But for now, but for now, we haven't yet received the fullness of this inheritance. We still see it kind of off in the distance. For another year, we are going to journey through the wilderness of this world as strangers and pilgrims. I'm glad we have one another. Glad I'm not alone. Glad to be here with you. I'm glad that we will be able to share this coming year together. Let us all remember the lessons of Israel in the wilderness, which were recorded for our instruction and our warning.